Well, hello, everyone, and welcome to Longevity and Continuity as an Independent Teacher. I am here uh, with Scott Postema and with Wes Callahan. And I see now that I've put them up in the wrong order because we were really hoping that our guest of honor, Wes Callahan, would be in the middle of the screen. Let me see if I can fix that. I think that's an important element here. <laughs> uh, all right, here we go. Yes, yes. I did it. You did it. <laughs> <laughs> well, welcome, Scott and Wes. Thanks for being here, and thanks for helping Thank you. Thank us, you. the teachers, out. Yeah, thanks. So the thought here is that uh, so we, uh, we have all made our way in this world to one degree or another as odd teachers. Um, I chose odd instead of independent because... You know, I know in, in, in both Scott and, and Wes's case, and mine as well, actually, uh, we've had associations with institutions, with schools. There have been times when we've been independent to different degrees. Uh, and so, you know, a big part of what we want to talk about today is just kind of how we make our way and the different, different tools that are available to us. So odd teachers, independent teachers, uh, longevity and continuity is is the theme today. Thanks everyone for tuning in. We can see that uh, several of you are watching and saying hello, uh, which I really appreciate. So we're gonna have a prolonged question and answer period at the end. Really this video is gonna be more about the question and answer than, than anything else. Um, but before we do that, we'll talk about some practical stuff. And first of all, uh, what we'd like to do is kind of give you guys our teaching bios. Uh, where well, all three of us are quite different animals. And so we'll kind of, in talking about our lives as teachers, we'll end up, uh, I think, opening up a lot of this of the topics that are on your minds as you approach your careers with Kepler. So maybe we could begin uh, with Scott. Scott, tell us about yourself as a teacher. How has your life been? Okay, well, uh, for the to start with, both odd with the O, O-D-D, and odd with A-W-E-D, <laughs> in that, uh, you know, uh, made an odd teaching career, but really odd to be here um, with uh, with Wes Callahan, uh, obviously the veteran um, of, uh, you know, online classical education. I don't know if anybody's been teaching online, and, and of course, before online, uh, longer than Wes uh, in the classical, you know, in the classical tradition. So uh, in any case, um, mine didn't start out classical. Um, I've been in uh, Christian education and ministry for about 25 years. And uh, one of my very first ministry jobs was to actually start a school. And um, I got paid based on how many students that we had, you know, in this Christian school. Um, so my salary was going to be de dependent on that. So I wasn't really an independent teacher there, but there was the sense in which, you know, if we don't have enrollment, we don't have tuition and we don't have a way to pay uh, a teacher. And so that's, that's kind of how I started. That's kind of cut my teeth in ministry that way. And then years later with a, a church planning endeavor, uh, we started a Christian school in Las Vegas. And uh, that was an interesting time uh, for a whole different set of reasons. Uh, a lot more of the logistics, the legalities and those kinds of things to, to do that kind of work in a big city. Um, and then about the last five years, I uh, have been teaching online um, uh, strictly in, in a classical setting and online uh, with a little bit of brick and mortar uh, mixed in with that. So that's that's my uh, history and background. Yeah, I think the the what, what you just said there are a little bit of brick and mortar mixed in. Uh, mm -hmm. I mean, I, I think that's a an that's an integral part of the experience, and it's going to be the experience of many of, of our teachers as well. Yeah. I'll, I'll go next because uh, you know we really do think that that Wes's experience is going to be one the one that's most illuminating uh, going to be most illuminating for you guys. Um, so 
fun. I carved out a career as an English as a oh. second language teacher. So I'm a Spanish teacher with Kepler, uh, and I, I have worked as a Spanish teacher. Uh, but it all started with a bookstore, basically. So teaching is a family thing. My dad was a, is a college professor. My mom was also an English as a second language teacher. And as an undergrad, I worked uh, at the English Language Institute at the University of Florida. My mom was a teacher, and I was one of the, the students who coordinated cultural activities for the internationals, which meant that we got to uh, go out to uh, clubs and to the mall with, uh, <laughs> with the students. Um, and I tutored language on and off for many years. But I opened a bookstore, uh, a, a used bookshop in South Carolina in 07, uh, which was a bad time to uh, open a bookshop and in 2010 I closed it. Um, but as I was closing it, one of my customers um, coordinated all the Spanish classes at the BMW plant in South Carolina. And she said, hey, aren't you a Spanish teacher? And like a lot of independent teachers, I'm always a teacher, right? Like I own a bookstore, but uh, yes, why yes, I am a Spanish teacher. Um, so I ended up going out to BMW and took over a class from a teacher who was leaving. And uh, within a few months, I was the actually the main option for English as a second language. Um, and so I, I entered the world of corporate training as an ESL teacher and occasional Spanish teacher. Um, and so that ended up being a, a situation where I, I would have clients that would, I would have agencies that would get me big clients like BMW or Michelin. Um, and then, uh, but I would also be looking for students on Craigslist and using word of mouth and uh, getting, uh, t uh, I'm, I'm Brazilian, so I would, you know, word of mouth was spread in Brazil through WhatsApp or Facebook. And I'd, so it just slowly that, that then ended up building. And, uh, but I also hodgepodged it. You know, I was, I was uh, talking to uh, George Harrell, one of our teachers this morning, and uh, um, uh, talking to him about the job I had for a couple of years uh, at a cigar bar in the evenings. Uh, the discount on the pipe tobacco was the most valuable thing there. But, uh, but you know, I did, I did other things as well. Um, so and I think that can be a, a part of the, of the independent teacher experience as well. But yeah, that's my story. Wes. Well, my experience probably hasn't been uh, as, as varied as, uh, as uh, that of you two gentlemen. Um, because I got into teaching while I was younger, I, th I think it sounds like uh, uh, than than you you two were. Um, I uh, when I finished uh, when I when I finished college and I got my degree, I I, I I can say that I don't I don't know how common this is, but um, I went through uh, all my years of college and graduated with a degree in history without ever, literally without ever uh, knowing what I was going to do with it, um, and it was not until after. Um, at least a year after I finished college that I even countenanced the idea of being a teacher. So I was not going through college with a plan in mind. Um, and that had some real downsides. I think it also had some real upsides. Mm -hmm. um, but um, um, so I, I finished college and I, I, um, for, I worked for about a year, a couple of years, I guess, uh, managing a hunting and fishing store and uh, because those are you know, some side interests and so on. And, and uh, at that time, uh, the local Christian school, Logos School, was just getting started, and I got sucked into the whirlpool of that. Um, and that turned out to be a great experience because at the end of my first year of teaching, this is, must have been 84 maybe, at the end of my first year of teaching, I came to two conclusions. The first was that I had done a terrible job of it, and the second was, was that teaching was what I had to do for the rest of my life. Um, and I, I don't know how I came to those two conclusions, but I knew them uh, ineluctably at the end of that first year. So um, I taught. Um, so I taught in I taught in private Christian schools. I taught briefly at the University of Idaho, um, a little bit at New St. Andrews. But the majority of my career has been uh, online and independent with Scola Classical Tutorials, um, <clears throat> which I'm still doing, and which has been sort of encapsulated in the Old Western Culture series that Roman Rhodes has produced. So I've been teaching uh, online for almost 24 years, I guess. I think I'm finishing my 23rd or 24th year. I'm not sure. Started in the fall of '97. Uh, and I got into that, as you mentioned, I think um, uh, the, there were, there were um, um, a couple of us that, as far as I know, were the only people teaching live online back then. Mm -hmm. And I got in through a friend who had gone to St. John's College in Annapolis in the early 90s, graduated, moved back to Escondido, California, and, uh, and uh, had the brilliant idea of trying to see if he could apply that, that kind of learning, the great books kind of learning, uh, to high school level and to local homeschoolers. 
And he did it for a year or two. And just about that time, the internet was becoming a thing. And for the first time, there's actually online conferencing. And he tried it uh, and the demand boomed. And uh, he called up here to Moscow, Idaho. I think he called it maybe Canon Press or something. And they put him in touch with me and off we went. So I've been doing it. Uh, I, I got into it through through him and I've been doing it um, uh, on, on my own. Well, he, he, he helped me set up. I didn't work for him, but he helped me set up. We were in close contact for a, for a bunch of years. Um, but I was doing my own thing. And then within a couple of years, a third guy got in. And I still think up until the late 90s, early 2000s, we were um, the, 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 the only three that I knew of that were that was doing live uh, online education. There were other kinds going on. Um, and of course, it's exploded since then. So this is my, my 23rd year. Uh, and, um, uh, and it was maybe, uh, um, I, I forget, but somebody in the audience might know, roughly eight years ago, uh, we began putting together um, through the um, through Roman Rhodes, who had the, the the brilliant capacity and capability and the vision to do all this. They put my lectures in the old Western Culture series. And so that's been sort of the the, the, the uh, summary of my teaching career. And I love I love that the summary of your teaching career includes uh, the the phrase uh, the internet was just becoming a thing. <laughs> Uh, I think there's a little bit of an echo. No, I think we're good. Okay, great. Uh, I'd love to hear, Wes, a little bit about... Um, so how have you put yourself out there? When when people take classes from you, do they find you as Wes Callahan? Do they have to know Wes Callahan? I don't know. Um, I think so. I, I, I have... Um... I have literally never advertised. Uh, when I first got into it, I got into it taking the overflow from this gentleman in, in Southern California, in, in down San Diego, and uh, he had uh, the boom was so great, uh, and the and the uh, uh, um, and the teacher the teaching opportunities were 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 so um, were were so or, or the, the the classes were so few online that we had we had uh, um, we had tremendous. And I think he did some advertising, maybe with Mary Pride's homeschooling magazine or something. Um, but um, I never had to advertise because I had a, uh, and this was unusual. This is a very much um, anomalous. Um, I had a huge load from the beginning and then, and then a word of mouth. I would have knots of students that began to grow in Cleveland and Dallas and Atlanta and, uh, and uh, um, you know, Berkeley of all places um, and Seattle. And, and they would spread the word. And I, and I, I certainly encouraged that. I was, and I was deeply grateful for it. Um, I never had to advertise. And I like that because, um, because um, I, I, I'm very appreciative of the fact that parents don't want to put their kids in a class with some internet teacher that they know nothing about. But if, but if they have the, the, the testimony of a friend who says, we had my class with Mr. Callahan for a year, we really liked him, they're going to listen to that. So word of mouth, I think, was far and away the best uh, advertising. I know I did have some people who, who uh, did internet searches, and I don't know what they searched for, Scola or West Callahan or Right, and that was like kind of my question, which was Scola. What is Scola? How does that work for you? Um, how does the Pell program work? Yeah, well, I mean, how does it work specifically from a, a, a marketing and gathering students' perspective? Well, uh, as I say, I did no marketing. I was just, I, uh, after, after a number of years, um, words, words spread and so on. Um, and I think... Um, um, <clears throat> I think my my job was primarily to 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 you know, field the emails, um, mm -hmm. which as my um, students know, and I think there's at least one person in here who's taking classes from me in, in the past. As as they know, um, I'm I'm really spectacular at promptly answering emails, not. But um, I, my job was to field the emails and, and welcome people in the class and run the classes. I, there was there was essentially no marketing at all. So. Um, uh, there were a few years when the demand was so great that I turned people away, but I tried never to do that. So some of my classes in the in the early and mid two thousands were quite large. In the late two thousands and the late two thousand teens, as as a result of the economy and other things and other and other um, uh, and many other groups kind of getting into the online game, uh, the numbers uh, dropped a little bit. But I've never, never um, even when the numbers are great, I never tried to turn students away. I wanted to make sure that they always had a place to go. And once they were in one of my classes, I would never say they couldn't. Sign up right. The next right. Right. So you know, I, I do want to, I do want to talk about how uh, how this word of mouth can work and how it can work for for teachers today. 
because it is a slightly different world. But, but before we do that, Scott, tell us about Poema. There we go. Um, yeah, I, I want to, I'd love to, let me, I'll say something about Poema here in just a second, but I want to just add something in that, um, that Wes said, um, be, kind of relates to the last webinar that we did um, about building your tribe. We talked about building your tribe. And, and I would actually, I would actually argue that um, whether Wes realized he was conscientiously marketing or not, he was marketing. And, and the way that he was marketing is the very way in which we were talking about building your tribe, which is building trust. That by word of mouth, people were saying, here's somebody you can trust. And once they took the course, they, they realized that was true. And then that word spread. And, and I think that is, it's permission marketing. It's the kind of marketing that says this person's earned trust and now your tribe is doing the marketing for you. And, mm. and so, you know, he may not be doing, you know, uh, all the social media stuff and, and the kinds of things that we do to try to get attention, but that's really not the marketing. That's, that's really just getting the, you know, the kind of attention that, um, that gives us the opportunity then to build trust, you know, so yeah. that's what real marketing uh, is happening. So, um, uh, well, let me actually let me roll into because uh, that actually yeah. leads into what I wanted to, to to follow up with with Wes on. So I, I think a lot of teachers will be thinking about this transitional period, right? I mean, it's a, it's it's potentially this is a transitional time for online education. But then, as they themselves they take on Kepler to different degrees, um, they they may or may not interact with other platforms. Uh, but you know, there's a you know, it, it's it's like with with some online platforms like YouTube, for example. Um, you know, big YouTubers acknowledge that it was way easier for them, uh, be not easier, yeah, easier because there was no one else in the field at that time, and so although the platform wasn't as small uh, as big, they were able to to be significant in the platform before it exploded. And that kind of carried them to a certain degree. And so at, when they give advice to other, you know, because I'm a YouTuber, this is why, you know, this is why it's a frame of reference for me. They give advice to uh, to new YouTubers. They acknowledge that there have, there have to be some different approaches. That being said, and so you, you came in early on, but, uh, you know, I wonder from both Wes and Scott how we could in, in, interact with the idea of accelerating word of mouth in a trusting way, right? Because right now, Wes, you're you're reaping the fruit of all these wonderful years of work, but you were also able to have to have work early and often. Uh, the the way that happened is is there anything in the way that happened that teachers today could could advantageously look at? You know, I don't know um, if I'm the best person to ask. I, uh, I, I don't know because I, all, all I um, all I know looking back uh, is that um, I did the best I could as a teacher, and I early on developed what's become kind of a kind of a, a seven point philosophy that I've lived by. Um, but but it's, it's essentially trying to be the best teacher I could, uh, and then um, when, as you said, when when I, uh, my, my tribe was building through no real effort of my own, except trying to be the best teacher I could. Uh, and then they would, you know, spread the word of mouth and they would, um, and younger siblings would take the classes older siblings had taken and cousins would then jump in and so on. Um, how that could be replicated um, now, I mean, the same thing has to happen, but how that will happen, I don't know. Uh, uh, in terms of, in, in terms of the, in terms of the, um, uh, the, the, the structure, the institution, Kepler is providing something uh, what I th that I think is a genuinely and tremendously unique. Um, the teachers, uh, can take advantage of Kepler's infrastructure, but the teachers still have to do the same thing. They have to be the best teachers they can, um, which means, um, well, you know, there's, there's some fundamental principles to that, but they have to be the best teachers that they can. And then, and then people, as you said, will do, will develop trust in them and, and, uh, and, uh, um, uh, the, the word will spread. Yes. I don't yes. I, I'm not that kind of a visionary. I don't know how we can translate that into what we're doing at Kepler. Well, I'll figure, well, I'll figure I, it out by listening to you guys. <laughs> Perfect. <laughs> no, I th well, I, I think in, in one way this is this is fantastic because um, it, it speaks again to this idea, you know, uh, as Wes said about Kepler, 
the idea here is that um, really we're just a bunch of folks who have the same vision of trying to be the best teacher we can be, um, wanting to serve people, wanting people to get this, and really feeling passionate about classical education and, and what it means. And so there's the passion, um, you know, the belief in this, you know, as a as a means of furthering the gospel of, of spiritual formation, of, of cultural renewal. Um, so we, we share that same belief. And then, you know, Kepler's building a sort of, you know, building a platform or an infrastructure, as Wes called it, um, to help teachers, to give them tools and things that, that are, um, are available to, to leverage those. But none of those are going to be substitutes for the longevity, the consistency, the generosity, not turning students away. I'll find a way to, to um, you know, to serve them uh, if at all possible. So there's generosity, there's consistency, there's longevity, um, and, and really striving to do your very best um, to please the Lord, to, to serve others. Um, and, and I think there's a reward to that. Um, the authenticity and the humility that comes with that um, is what is going, the teachers are going to be rewarded by that. Um, and, and so Kepler really is just an infrastructure, a place for everybody to gather so they can do that well. And I think, you know, just to throw one other thought and turn this back to Joffrey, but um, the, you know, uh, teachers who don't have that passion, people who aren't, you know, this is not their vocation and calling. Wes said something early on that he realized, I'm not a very good teacher, but I have to do this the rest of my life. Um, I, I think two things uh, are really clear in that statement, that there's a kind of humility that recognizes, I love this and I'm not good at it. I don't know how to, I got to get better, but all I can do is just keep trying. Um, and I think when a teacher comes, you know, uh, you know, to this vocation with that kind of, you know, disposition, um, they're going to succeed. And if somebody's going to try to use it to manipulate the system, to try to, you know, to do something different, they're not going to succeed. That will show up. That will come out um, in, you know, in the long term. So uh, anyway, I, you know, whether Wes, you're acknowledged, you know, you, you have a, an awareness of what that uh, looks like in terms of, you know, marketing trends and, and using the terminology, um, but you have it authentically. And I think that's really what the teachers um, can benefit from. You know, and that's a, a drum we've been beating on is that, you know, as we've urged teachers to market themselves, we've we've urged them to remember that they must remain themselves, right? To have any actual last, you may be able to fill a class for this coming term uh, by not being yourself, but you're not going to last. It's just not something you'll be able to pull off. You have to be yourself. And however you're thinking of marketing, you, you, ha you have to always hold that in front of you because you want sustainability. Um, you know what Wes's comment about you know about, about Kepler and that, you know it, it, his experience led him to recognize the value of Kepler and, and I you know Kepler touches my experience as well um, and improves upon it. So you know because of my career, I was a I, I saw the value of agencies, right? And so I know that that most of the teachers watching this and, and you guys, you know, you worked in a different setting, but for me, agencies brought me work and put bread on the table. And my biggest, the biggest agency that I interacted with, they were loyal to me for many years and I was loyal to them. But that loyalty was strictly, we give you clients, you keep our clients happy. And it was, that was a wonderful relationship, honestly. But on top of like Kepler does that and more. There's all this support and really the collegial atmosphere that is already beginning to develop between the teachers. So I think there are, there are, we, we are already being able to help each other and I'm looking forward to seeing how, how that evolves. So you know, there's a there's this extra there's extra bit of 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 oomph that that Kepler can can lend us. But you know, so as independent teachers, I think we the three of us see uh, how Kepler can be can be valuable for us. But uh, we don't necessarily have to be limited to Kepler. Uh, in fact, uh, none of us are strictly limited to Kepler. Uh, which brings up a, a question from Andrew Cheney, which I'll I'll, I'll bring up shortly. Um, but before we do that. A former student of yours is curious uh, to have you uh, just kind of tell us what your seven point philosophy for excellence as a teacher is. I, I should have expected from Helen. I have fond memories of Helen. She's one of the memorable students from my out of out of thousands over the over the uh, twenty odd years I've taught. So I'm I'm delighted to see her here. Um, thanks for the question, Helen. All right. Oh, well, yeah, I can, I can, I can run through that. I wanted to have years ago. I thought I've got to come up with like three points, right? I could never reduce it to the three points. 
um, because they're just distinct enough. So I can, I'll, I'll try and um, run through them. But the first one, obviously, is uh, the teacher has to have what a lot of people would call passion. I don't, I don't like to use that word just because, you know, I don't. But uh, love for the subject is obvious. If the, if the teacher doesn't love the subject, um, you need to go lay bricks. You need to have love for the for the subject, whether whatever it is you're teaching history or, you know, or or uh, you know, cooking or or, or whatever. Um, and, and I think more broadly, love for knowledge in general, the, the love for the acquisition of of knowledge. Um, Aristotle says that um, the love of knowledge is innate, but it can be it can be cultivated and should be. And and and, and then uh, of, of utmost importance, love for the students. The teacher needs to love this. You need to love the subject and to love the students. So this this love. Uh, for knowledge and for the students who are recipients of the knowledge that you have to offer uh, is, uh, is, is critical. And of course, there's all, all kinds of philosophizing behind this that we could get into and the, and the great thinkers of the past have led me to these positions, but there it is, a love for knowledge and a love for the student. Um, and secondly, uh, in order to be a good teacher, there needs to be, there needs to be growth. You need to grow in, uh, your knowledge, in the knowledge of your subject. Never rest on the notes that you've taken. And I know teachers who have I had college professors who did this, who year after year taught from the same notes. And as far as I know, they, uh, they reached the point where they plateaued and never continued to increase it. So they, there should be a, a desire to continue to learn, learn more about the subject you're teaching, reading and studying and, you know, and uh, journals and talking to people and so on. And, and, a, and a growth, you, there should be a growth not only in the knowledge of your subject, but knowledge in general. You should be a kind of person who wants to be, you know, be taking, taking knowledge in because that, provides, um, <clears throat> because that provides a broader perspective, provides context for the particular subject you're teaching and so on. Uh, and this kind of growth in, 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 in knowledge um, should be acquired by uh, not only the independent study, which uh, we independent teachers are really good at, having a big library and, and uh, sitting alone under the lamp late at night, you know, with your pipe and your book, but by collegial fellowship, by, by making, and this is especially important for independent teachers where there's, we're, 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 we're not so naturally thrown into contact with other people. We have to kind of debate that. So there needs to be, um, there needs to be collegial inter intercourse, interchange of knowledge and ideas and getting together at conferences and, you know, and, and the cigar and bourbon by the pool at the Holiday Inn in Houston at the, at the summer conference or whatever, the, uh, and, and visiting amongst each other informally. And Scott and I recently had a delightful afternoon at his place. That kind of thing is, 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 is nourishing and nurturing and absolutely central. So, you know, there's love and the growth, uh, the growth that are necessary. And, and I think curiosity is, um, uh, is, is a point as well. I could have put this under growth because curiosity is the engine that drives growth. But to be curious, uh, or to, to, to cease being curious, is to die intellectually. Um, and there are ways to cultivate curiosity too. Um, but, but, to be, but to be curious, to want to know, not just to desire to increase your, your knowledge of, of the subject and of, not, and of learning in general, because, um, <clears throat> because Wes Callahan said so, or because you want to be a better teacher, but because you yourself cannot live without it. I can remember at a particular point in my life, very early on, before I became a teacher, or when I was just becoming a teacher, um, I realized um, that um, I was not going to become a teacher because I wanted to be a teacher. I was going to become a teacher because I loved knowledge and I wanted to communicate it to people. And who do you communicate knowledge to? Oh, students, right, okay. So, but I can remember a point where I, where I was studying desperately for myself and I can remember having what felt to me like a, a, a genuinely physical craving to get what there was in the books on my shelves because I hadn't been given that in the public schools I went to, including the university. Um, so there needs to be a real curiosity. And there needs to be, I guess this is what, my fourth point, there needs to be a diversity of interest, both of intellectual interest and of practical and physical occupations too. One of the things uh, Scott and I talked about recently was uh, the fact that um, I think it took me some, while, uh, some time to appreciate this and, I, and, I'm, and I'm, I'm always hoping I will never lose the appreciation for it, but I live on a farm, have always lived on farms, and it's an active farm. My father and I work this farm, and the fact that I can teach in the morning and then go out and help my father on the farm, you were fixing the tractor, and we're fixing fences, and we're, you know, clearing brush, um, that kind of, that kind, that kind of uh, balance to the intellectual life is really necessary for those of us who left to our own devices would hole up in our study and burn the midnight oil, and be narrow-minded and restricted in our interest. Um, so there needs to be this diversity of, of both of intellectual interests and of 
practical and physical occupations too. Uh, and for many people, uh, that's given to us naturally. We just need to, to, to appreciate it. The families, wives and children, the garden, the house that you just bought, um, you know, the garden that needs fixing and you don't have money to send it to a mechanic. So you crawl under yourself after watching some YouTube videos. All those things expand and keep the, keep the broadness of the person that are necessary. Um, I think uh, my fifth point is uh, there needs to be direction. Uh, there need to be short and long-term goals. Uh, and I haven't always, uh, at many points in my teaching career, people said, you know, what are your goals? I wouldn't have known. Uh, well, to keep teaching. But uh, to have goals is, is helpful, both in terms of long-term and short-term. But there's a limitation to this. Uh, goals shouldn't prevent us from being flexible and open to new directions that pop up when we encounter other people, uh, when new opportunities arise. Uh, one of the best things ever that happened to me in my teaching career was when Daniel Fukushan came along with Roman Rhodes and said, let's make videos of your lectures. That gave me a new goal and a new purpose. Um, and uh, that really helped to solidify things that have been vague and inchoate in the back of my mind. Um, and those were just those was handed to me. Daniel handed that to me on a platter. Um, but other, there, I've had, had to develop other goals that have helped. So having goals in terms of I want to be especially good at this subject. I want to have you know, all the translations of this classical author. Uh, I would like to be, um, you know, whatever, whatever the goals are, um, I would like to have this many students or I'd like to work in the circumstance, uh, but goals and direction uh, help. Um, and then um, this, I think Scott mentioned this earlier, maybe it's you, Joffrey, I forget, but, to, but to humility is absolutely essential. Uh, an acknowledgement to yourself and to your students of your limitations Every year, when my when my um, uh, uh, at the end of the, the grade books four uh, early moderns, when my students are coming to the end of their high school career, they've been with me for four years. I give a kind of a, make a, a sort of valedictory comment at the in the last class, and and the and I tell I always make sure to tell them this: um, you're going to find people, my dear students, when you get to college and in future life, who knew who know more than me. You're going to find out Mr. Callan had been, made mistakes. I screwed up. I was an error. I didn't fill in the gaps. Bad emphasis. Um, but you will never find, I can guarantee you will not find someone who loves this subject more than I do or who loves you more than I do. Mm -hmm. so I, I, want to acknowledge, I want to acknowledge my limitations, but my limitations don't keep me. In fact, my limitations, if, I'm, if, if I have the humility of acknowledging my, my limitations, as Socrates and everybody else teaches us, then I'm open to the possibility of learning more, and, I, and, and that can be a good model for the students as well as encouragement to my own soul. And also, humility requires uh, that we acknowledge our debt to the tradition that we're in, the teaching tradition. There, uh, we're, we're in a tradition, whether we like it or not, and, we're in, and we should learn from the great teachers of the past from, and, 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 and be humble enough to, to, to learn at the feet of the C.S. Lewis's and the uh, and the uh, um, you know and the and the uh, and the Thomas Aquinas's and the Aristotles, um, and, and not think like like uh, and, and not be the sort of free thinker who thinks I'm the first person ever to teach this. We know better than that. But I'm the first person ever to come up with this idea. I'm the best teacher ever. That's not true. I'm in a tradition, and learning from those who have paved the way is going to be an essential uh, uh, aspect of my own of my own teaching. And then, and then finally, um, I need to keep in mind perspective. Um, the, what is, you know, what is my telos? What is the chief end of man? Um, being, get, going back to God, as uh, Irenaeus, the great early Christian father said, going to God, being, you know, whether we, whether we call it sanctification or theosis or the beatific vision or partakers of the divine nature, being reunited, being restored. But, but, um, but God is my ultimate goal and nothing else matters as much as that does. And so everything else, Aristotle and Thomas Aquinas both talked about wisdom in terms of, um, uh, in terms of um, uh, architecture. An, architecture an, an architect knows the, has a vision and he knows the end goal um, the building that he wants to see built. And so he calls all the tradesmen who each know their own craft, but he's got the, the overall vision of the telos for the project. And so uh, he calls all the tradesmen to make sure that everything happens in the right order and at the right time. And Aristotle and Thomas Aquinas both say, and I think this is brilliant on their part, that real wisdom is the art of an architect, is to judge and order rightly all the details of our lives so that we achieve our final goal. Being a teacher is not the most important thing in my life. It's not my final goal. It's what God has given me as part of arriving at my final goal. But God 
and him alone in Christ is the is the ultimate goal. And so keeping that perspective, um, now you're not always sitting back and thinking, now what theologic is my perspective as I'm preparing this lesson, but always knowing that that's my goal um, is going to help me with all of the other things, with love for my students, with uh, with humility and so on. Um, and so um, I, I should have added this maybe as an eighth point, but that would mess up seven. Seven's a holy number, right? Uh, <laughs> but the eighth point, uh, uh, nobody can be a good teacher if they're not a person who's striving to be a person of prayer. You should pray for yourself and you should pray for your students and whoever else is involved in your educational project. But if you're not praying for your students, you will not love them. And if you're not praying for yourself, you won't have the humility and the wisdom to seek direction from God and to, and to ask him to help you with all the things you're doing. So, you know, um, Every Christian should know this, but a teacher should know that, that, it, that it applies to his life. A teacher shouldn't be saying, oh, and also I'm a Christian, so I should have my prayer time. A teacher, a teacher should acknowledge to him or herself that prayer is absolutely essential to being a good teacher and to doing all these things. All right, that's the end of my rant. It, oh, a wonderful rant. And when, when, I, when, I hear, when, when I hear this, you know, there, I'm sure this is connecting with, with different uh, different members of the audience in different ways, but uh, I'm particularly struck by prayer uh, and, you know, love. You've mentioned love so many times and loving the students. You know, I think if I love my students, I'll be able to keep doing this. Uh, well, I'll, I'll tell you, I'm, I'm sorry, but I'll, I'll tell you one, one fundamental reason that I, that I know to emphasize, emphasize this in my life is when I look back at the teachers who influenced me in high school and college, uh, it was the, the the ones who influenced me positively were the ones who loved me and loved their subject, and uh, and a couple of them I could tell loved God, um, but there was negative influences too. And the and the subjects I hated in high school, one of which was history of all things, mm. was because I had teachers who didn't care about me or the subject. Mm. Right. And, and that had a tremendous influence on me. So I, one of one of my main goals in life. Uh, as a teacher, is to be like the teachers that influence me positively, and to not be like the teachers who influence me negatively. You know, there are some aspects of, of there are some of these that I think any teacher uh, would would really benefit from these. But there there are some in particular that strike me as being particularly useful for independent teachers because they would be a little harder to live out uh, in an institution that was kind of you know, ordering my day and telling me what I teach. And, you know, of, of course, I think any teacher would want to bring all of these into play. But the beauty of being an independent teacher is that I, I, can, I could bring all of, the, all of these into how I go about my business. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, do you have any comments, Scott, on this before uh, I, I bring a couple of questions up? No, other than that was just pure gold, and I, I think I think our teachers. <laughs> other than Carlos' comment, basically that. Yeah, ran, ran away. Uh, yeah, that, that was just that that was remarkable. Um, so, um, well, and, but you mentioned the you mentioned the fact that as um, as an independent teacher, one of the things you know, I, I get the privilege of meeting all the teachers you know uh, that are interested in teaching at Kepler and 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 kind of walking through the process of of you know through the interview process to, to determine is this the kind of teacher that has the same vision we do and and we typically talk about uh, briefly a threefold vision that is or or uh, what we'd call our maybe our core values and that is a mere Christian approach a broadly classical approach. Um, and a historically conservative approach, you know, within that uh, that framework. Um, but what strikes me is that, um, you know, as we filter out teachers who, you know, may have wanted to come to Kepler because they, you know, thought they could teach Minecraft or something, um, you know, and, and, and eliminating those, um, is the fact that a lot of our teachers who um, are coming to Kepler um, have a passion or, uh, and I know I Wesley want to use that word, but, uh, but, but to have a love for a desire for um, the ability to, um, you know, to really fulfill their calling as a teacher, their vocation, yeah. um, knowing that they're called to this and yet they're limited in a public school setting, or uh, maybe they're limited uh, by, uh, unfortunately, even within Christian institutions, uh, pedagogical or, or administrative politics, um, you know, all these things that, you know, that come into play. So the Kepler teacher comes because they want to be able to do what they're called to do. Uh, the platform provides them with that. But to get to my point, 
Um, what struck me is that a lot of the teachers came because they're saying, it sounds too good to be true that I could actually embrace those kinds of things that Wes just talked about. Yeah. That I could actually that 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 could be my life. I could actually do that. Um, and and so it's encouraging to th to think that the kinds of teachers who are attracted, you know, to a model like Kepler um, has, you know, uh, at least maybe not that well defined, but but at least have have those kinds of desires to. Um, uh, to teach that way and, and fulfill their calling as a Christian, you know. So anyway, I just, that's what I wanted to point out. Uh, now would be a good time uh, for you guys to uh, put in the comment section your practical questions. Um, so you know, th think whatever challenges or or areas of, of you know, terra incognita, I guess, uh, that you've been uh, facing, now is the time to, uh, to, to post those comments, those questions, and we'll begin to interact with them. Uh, before we do that, though, I, I want to share Lori's comment. I love all your emphases, uh, speaking to Wes. Praying for my students has been so important over the years, and having passion for them and for the topic has been key. My hardest is the goals and directions. And I share this because, Lori, that's the hardest for me as well. Um, and then there was a, a conversation that erupted, I think, when Wes was talking about loving subjects and the comments uh, exploded with uh, things about needlepoint and knitting. I think that's when that happened. <laughs> <laughs> and then Scott's comment uh, about Minecraft it made me think about the student I just had who handed in a, an oral Spanish project by doing a, a Minecraft tutorial. So you, you never know what might pop up. But yeah, um, all right, let's, let's uh, address Andrew Cheney's excellent question, uh, which he actually posted at the beginning of the video and has been waiting for patiently. As an independent teacher, do you make ends meet by teaching for multiple online platforms or stick to one online platform? I think we'll all have opinions on this. Since Scott was the first one to use the word platform, uh, I would love for him to take it first. Yeah, um, one of the one of the uh, the key uh, desires of Kepler, uh, just to kind of um, kind of undergird this question, kind of the some background to the question, is that we as independent teachers who are coming to 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 create this platform recognize that independent teachers need to have some diversity. They 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 um, or they often want to have diversity. Some of them may want to write. Some of them may farm. Some of them may you know they may be doing other things outside of teaching that they're um, uh, that they're <laughs> sorry I just saw Carlos comment uh, that they're uh, you know that that coincides with their teaching that you, and you know, say may but that's already a fact on Kepler uh, I mean yeah. you know so Wes is here uh, but what we ha we were talking about you know, all the authors that we have and the writers that we have yeah. on staff go on on staff yeah. and we have at Kepler. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. The, the, you know, there's a diversity of interests. And I think that, you know, as, as we're building a kind of an independent um, teaching platform, it may be that there are teaching opportunities. Um, when I first started an online classical education, I was teaching online uh, at two different places and in a brick and mortar, um, you know, you know, situation. And, and uh, you asked about Poima earlier, Poima started because a pastor called me up and asked me if I would teach his kids. And then uh, once somebody found out I was teaching his kids, they said, can my kids come? And then they told their friends and, and pretty soon, uh, like word of mouth, you know, I had um, several years of teaching a group of kids in addition to these other uh, these other platforms. And so one of the policies that Kepler has, and I think we're very proud to say this, is we don't hamstring any of our teachers. You're not locked in here um, in terms of uh, a non-compete clause. So if, if you come to teach at Kepler and then you find an opportunity that allows you to, uh, to fulfill your calling here, and then it's another kind of platform or another interest, uh, by all means, we would encourage you and say, do that. If it's fulfilling and it's meeting the needs and it's helping you achieve the goals that you have uh, as an online teacher, you know, by all means. But everyone's, I, I would say that every person's situation is going to be different to answer Andrew's question directly. Um, you might find some benefit in concentrating your efforts in one place over a long period of time. Um, but then again, you know, 
different circumstances come up for different people. And I think you just have to be wise, you know, about what those opportunities might look like. That's my take. Yeah, uh, I'll, uh, I'll just jump in. Uh, I, I did um, for most of my, um, most of my online teaching career, in fact, all of my on online teaching career, I was I was primarily making ends meet uh, just through Scola, through through my through my online business. But I did uh, periodically over the years. Uh, I have occasionally you know, um, uh, taught briefly on the side with uh, um, a local live school or with another internet school, but uh, but primarily. So it's it's it's, it's possible, and I certainly did um, um, make my living by by uh, as an independent teacher uh, just. Um, um, just on, on my platform. I think the same thing could be done through Kepler. I was going to say, um, one, uh, I agree with Scott, one of the great things about Kepler is they don't have that, that lock-in feature where you're required not to, you know, not to compete. Um, but I don't, but, um, but I think that's one of the many things that will draw people to Kepler and help make it possible um, for this to be the, the, this to be the place where you could um, actually make um, your entire living without having to, um, you know, serve fries on the side or whatever the whatever the other thing is, and I think Kepler will be make it more possible than many other online um, infrastructures would. Yeah, and Scott mentioned uh, that at Kepler we're we're proud of not locking people in, uh, and I can testify to that. That was one of the things that drew me to Kepler in the first place. Coming from a uh, a little subset of the teaching world in which that basically doesn't exist. Or everywhere else it does, but you know, in online ESL teaching, that's not a thing. People go to different platforms and have different relationships, and that's the norm. It was one of the things that kept me there and kept me away from some other platforms and some other subjects I might teach was that I didn't want to be locked in. So I'm actually, I it, it is it is true that the vision uh, for not locking people in is 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 a key part of Kepler. And you know, as as far as my own experience, Andrew, as an ESL teacher, um, the the people that I knew who were who worked full time, including myself, had a relationship or two that were much bigger than the others. Um, so you know, if 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 you if you if you want to be teaching full time or close to full time, strictly independently. Um, then you know having multiple platforms is is great. I think you're going to need that, but I think you're also going to need to have a platform or two, which are your primary relationships, so that the people on those platforms are thinking of you uh, often, early and often. Uh, if you guys are asking questions uh, and and I don't address them or we don't address them, please feel free to repost them. I'm really uh, enjoying all the interactivity here. Um, all the interaction here. Wes, a question for you, a technical question, I suppose. Uh, what platforms were you using in the 90s? <laughs> <laughs> we we began with uh, with a platform called See You See Me, um, which went through a number of iterations. Uh, I think it was produced by a company called White Pine Software. Um, I still think very fondly of it. Uh, I, I liked it. And then we moved to Microsoft Net Meeting, and then I moved to... Um, um, oh, you guys all know it's a, it's, 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 it's a big one, big company. They, they especially do corporate uh, um, uh, intranets and so on. Uh, and, and, and now I'm with Zoom. What was the one I was with before? Daniel probably knows. Anyway, so I've gone through at least four, probably five uh, platforms. And all of them were audio, video, chat, conferencing things. The earlier ones were pretty limited in their capabilities. They couldn't all do all the things the modern ones, the more modern ones do. And I like that. Uh, I've tried to deliberately avoid using all the bells and whistles on platforms because I want the platform to be as transparent as possible. So it's me and the students interacting with each other. And that, by the way, is part of, uh, 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 Helen asked a question. She was one of, um, um, she says, uh, being one of my students, she remembers the, the community and friendships that built up in the student forums and other places. And that was intentional. Um, it was, uh, uh, we've, we've lost the forums because of Facebook. Uh, and 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 other and other things, but the but the forums were one way bulletin boards where the students interacted. That was a huge deal, um, and that was one of the many ways that I tried to create a, the, a, a, as much as. And I was my thinking was pretty inchoate and haphazard, but I was trying to to foster just that feeling of community because it's necessary. Um, you know, it's like C.S. Lewis joins 
Then he joins Oxford. He's a modeling college in Oxford. He becomes one of the fellows. That's that the, the, the fellowship is a is a is a, a deliberate vocational involvement with a group of people who are doing what you're doing, and um, and I wanted my students to you know to um, to feel that. Um, I don't. I, I was rather haphazard, I'm sure, in the way I did it, but it was uh, but it was very good for them, and it was very good for me. Um, because I knew that I wasn't just teaching random particulars, this person, that person, but a, but a body of students where the individuals were their individual selves, but they're also part of a body uh, with whom I was interacting and, and uh, for whom, whom I was perhaps some of the teacher, but just the guy out in front who'd been walking down the path a little bit longer, yahooing and waving arms and saying, hey, everybody, look under this bush, something cool here. Um, and to, to have a community uh, that I was part of made a big uh, difference for me because otherwise, uh, other than that, I was alone. I was me and my study in my office up on the second floor of my house. And this touches directly on uh, our last webinar, y'all. When we you know, were, we're talking, we were talking about being mammalian, right? And so, you know, having community is an important part of, of marketing as we were emphasizing in the last one, but as, be, as is being emphasized by Wes now, an important part of your longevity of having a true and satisfying career as an independent teacher. So build those communities. Uh, don't be in a hurry to do it, but have it as a priority. Yeah, 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 absolutely. And by the way, uh, Daniel's right, WebEx, uh, Cisco uh, um, was, the, was the company behind WebEx, and I used that for a, a quite, a, quite a number of years. I could also throw in, I see that uh, Gregory Soderberg asked about assessments. I've never done them. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's not entirely true. I don't do quizzes. I don't do tests. I often assign papers and I never mess with them. I'm terrible. Uh, so this is just the oddball. I, I don't think assessments are bad. I think they should be carefully, carefully considered because the tradition of, us, of assessing in education in the last century and a half, two centuries is abysmal. Uh, and, and I had horrible experiences with assessments in my high school and college career. And so I just chose to dispense with them. And I think it worked for me, but I, I don't think they're bad. I just never did them. So yeah, sorry, Gregory, <laughs> it hasn't changed. Well, Gregory makes a very interesting comment, which I'm sure uh, Daniel is looking at carefully. It would be great if the new Kepler LMS could have a forum feature. And now whether yeah. that, that comes to fruition or not, um, it's, you know, that's the kind of, of, of priority I think. That, Absolutely. That it, it, interaction should have. That a forum, you know, when we think of the word forum, we don't necessarily need to think of a 90s style internet forum where you think of a certain layout. We need to be thinking of forum in the actual classical sense of what a forum is. And there are different ways to build those online, including the classical fora. I know that Helen Howell is talking about using Goodreads as one of her platforms, and they use the old school uh, forum in the group. Which you know, so that's that's a that's a cool thing. So Lori comments that she hates grading too. But how do you assign grades, which parents expect without assessments? <laughs> now <laughs> we're moving slightly off topic, but uh, but there's no way that all of the teachers watching aren't dying of curiosity to know the answer to this. Yeah. Well, can can I? Uh, I'll just answer this one briefly and then let Scott go. But I I, I I said not really because I do assess my students. I'm always thinking about who is where in their in their trajectory. And so uh, every year I've always told told parents, uh, if you ask me, I will, I will give you a suggested grade. Uh, and, um, and if you ask me, I'll give you a written evaluation. Um, and I prefer the written evaluations and I, and I, and I grudgingly can make the concession of, of uh, giving a suggested letter grade. Um, but, uh, but and that'll be based on, on uh, student participation and enthusiasm and, you know, happy faceness and hand waving and general gleeful yahooing in the class. Um, so participation and um, and I'm also for many many years. I know Helen will remember this too. I did have on the forums a place where every week I required the students to post a brief one paragraph personal response to the week's work, the reading and the discussion and so on. I told them I wouldn't grade it, but I would count up the number by the end of the year, and that would enter into, if they were at least doing it, that would enter into the, so I did have a certain kind of assessment, but I tried to keep it as informal as possible. I hate number letter grades, but I would grudgingly give them a recommended one if a parent asked. I much prefer a written evaluation, so where, where um, which I think is far more, um, you know, old school university style, where there'd be oral and uh, oral evaluations and written essays and so on. 
Now, but before Scott goes, actually, I would like to uh, I'd like to make a a, a comment uh, and then say as we approach the end of this of this webinar. Um, so this is kind of the last chance to get in some practical questions. And then for you gentlemen, um, what I'd like to close with, uh, so not now, we'll, we'll let Scott go and then we'll see if any questions come in. But the, the question I'd like to close with is, um, I am interested in longevity as a teacher. I want longevity as an independent teacher. How do I start right? Okay, not, I don't want to step by step, but I'd love to hear some advice from you guys. But let's not answer that yet. Uh, Scott, please go ahead. I don't even know if you were going to say something, but it seemed like Wes sensed that you were going to say something. No, I, I would. I would. The only thing I would follow up with what Wes said is I think we put too much stock in this idea. And I mentioned this in Jordan Harrell's um, thing earlier today, just when I, I posted a comment, I think we put too much stock in this objective subjective, you know, dichotomy when we're grading a student's thinking that by building a rubric or some sort of um, objective that we can really assess. Uh, because I can tell you uh, just by spending the time with the students and, and let's say they do an exam, most of the exams I give are, well, all the exams I give are all essay written exams, you know, they, they write essays or, um, you know, short essay answers. Um, but the, what I can tell you is there will be a student who may just write a word uh, or a couple words and they'll technically get the answer right, but they, they're not thoughtful. They haven't, you know, so there is a subjective nature when you get to know the students um, where I don't think a teacher giving an honest assessment can be objective in the grade and number sense that we typically want to try to do, um, which um, at Kepler, we do require some assessments. Um, and, and I think assessments are helpful and they're good. And I would agree with a couple of people said, you know, hate grading. Um, but I think a lot of times we hate grading because we bought into the idea that somehow this letter grade or, or percentage grade is going to really reflect an assessment of how well the student did. Um, I, I can much easier, you know, sit down and talk with a parent or, or like Wes said, write an evaluation uh, because I've spent time with the student. I'm, I'm engaging with them in Socratic dialogues and discussions along the way and listening uh, or reading what they're writing um, and how, how much they've actually conceptualized it and, and actually embraced, um, you know, over the time, or whether they're just trying to get the answers done. And sometimes the letter grade, a lot of times the letter grade just doesn't reflect that. Um, so I, I guess I, I wouldn't really uh, put a whole lot of stock, um, you know, in what that letter grade actually means. Education and grades don't always value or don't always equate to one another. But anyway, that's all I was going to say. Well, thank you everyone for all, all of your questions. I just want to put this back up on the screen for a moment and uh, remembering that it ends it ends with prayer. Um, you know, one of my big takeaways from this, because I actually, I had not heard this before and I'm so glad Helen asked. I don't know if it was part of your plan, Wes, but uh, I, mean, I, I actually, I think that this, it, at, at looking at them as values, so it can, it could get abstract and it'll be, you know, it, it's going to be down to us to apply this, but I actually think there's something of a roadmap here for longevity and continuity as an independent teacher. So if we're able to keep these things kind of in the front of, of, of our mind, Wes, I was uh, I, I would I would uh, I would add um, these things are all things that a um, that a, that, a, that a person can do uh, if they're a teacher. And I, and I don't mean if they have a job as a teacher or if they have signed up with with an institution. Um, if you're if if you're married, you can do things to cultivate the the love that you're supposed to have for the other person. If you've got plants growing in the garden, there are things you can do to nurture it. You can water and pull the weeds and make sure it has full sun and play Leonard Skinner at full volume. But if there's no plant, there's no, then then acknowledge it. If you're not married, the, there are certain things you can't do. And so um, uh, uh, if, if a teacher is at the beginning of the career, one of the things, I'm not saying doubt yourself or question everything or be all angsty and negative late at night, but one of the things you can do is, uh, is say, uh, am I a teacher? Um, because being a teacher, I, I really think uh, is a gift. And I don't mean a gift in the sense of where people say, oh, you're such a good pianist. You have such a gift. And the pianist says, why, thank you. No, I, you know, that's not praise from me because I do nothing to have the gift. If I have, if, if I, if I'm a teacher that is, 
And I'm not saying uh, being a good teacher. I just know that I'm a teacher and God has made me that. That's a gift from him and entirely something he's given and something I can acknowledge with gratitude and then work to nurture by these seven things and whatever else. Uh, but if I'm, but, but, but if I have the sense that I'm not a teacher, um, I should go find out what I am because there's other glorious things to be. Mm-hmm. Um, and so, um, so uh, you, you, you're saying something, Joffrey, about um, uh, about um, you know, what, what, what do you say to students or to teachers who are at the beginning about how to um, yeah. think about longevity and continuity? I think these are the things that you that you do if you if you know that you're a teacher, if you know that you've been given this. And I don't mean you know a, a calling from God where the heavens open, and because I, uh, I didn't have that at the end of that first year when I knew I'd been a terrible a terrible teacher and I should do it for the rest of my life. It wasn't that heavens open kind of thing. I just that was the first time in my life where I had ever. Um, I, I suddenly realized I'd been I'd been uh, I'd been feeling satisfaction and fulfillment and loved what I was doing. So mm-hmm. in terms of continuity, if, if if you know this is and sometimes it takes time as well. You can't decide I'm going to be a teacher for the rest of my life right now. It might take 10 years to know that you shouldn't be a teacher or that you should continue doing it. Um, but to the extent that you think that you are teacher, <laughs> Um, then there are things you can do, and the seven things I came up with are just seven seven things. There are probably others as well, but there are things you can do to cultivate that now and start thinking about now, um, starting with, of course, prayer. Mm-hmm. Yeah, there are some things on that, you know, those things that we can do. There are several that the, the Kepler community, this collegial thing, this consortium, we can help each other with yeah. them. Scott, uh, what advice would you give? Yeah, I'm a new, I'm a new, not a new teacher, but I'm I'm new to this journey as an independent teacher. What would you advise me to to begin to do first? Yeah, great, great question. And I'm just going to build on what Wes said. I think number one, you you need to know you're called to teach. Um, I spent 20 years pastoring, church planting. And uh, when I look back before I realized that, you know, that I was a teacher, and, and I'll say this just real briefly, that I realized the things that I loved about the pastoral ministry was teaching, teaching the Bible. Um, every time we planted a church, we started a school, um, you know, a Christian school there. Um, all of the, the opportunities that to teach were always where I was geared to, and that's where I seemed to 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 succeed. And I loved that was the part I loved about it. Um, and it took me twenty years to realize I'm called to teach, not you know, as a Christian teacher, not necessarily a pastor. Uh, and those are different. Uh, but but I realized that calling was uh, was very specific. Um, so building on that, and I think that's super important. Lean into the opportunities you have to build and do it slowly over a long period of time and be patient and um, and realizing if if you're jumping in going, I'm going to try this and I'm, I'm hoping this year I get a thousand students and and I'm, you know, uh, going gung ho. I, I, I think you're going to you're going to fail. It's going to be very discouraging. But if you're a teacher, you're called to do this. There'll be no problem being patient and flipping fries on the side, so to speak, while you're building that community of people. And then that kind of clutch effect where where you're leaning into this, um, you have, you're, you're comfortable having time, letting it build up. Um, I really do believe that we have the opportunities today and, and the need for truly called teachers to succeed. Um, but take the time, be consistent, lean into it, you know, be patient. And above all, I think one of the things Wes said was be humble um, because then you're going to keep learning and keep growing and, and, and you'll be patient. Yeah, you know. that's, that's, that's really excellent advice, especially the patience part, because there's a certain uh, um, there's a certain sense in which probably for, for many beginning teachers, thinking about continuity and longevity might not be the best thing for them. Do what you you know, if you want to teach now this year, teach this year really well. The present is the place to focus. Um, do it now and then and, and don't don't worry about whether you're going to be a long term teacher or not. You probably will be, but you never know. Yeah. Um, you know, connecting to the sense of calling that Wes was talking about and the patience that, that both of you guys were, uh, were, 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 were speaking on. You know, one of the ways I knew, I, I, loved, I loved teaching, but, you know, probably the biggest way I knew you know, I, I need to be a teacher is that my wife likes me best when I'm teaching. <laughs> not, not, not saying in the classroom, but when, I, when I'm teaching, Kimberly likes me better. Um, and, but 
that meant that, you know, as, as, as I worked independently and as clients, you know, cause I, you know, so, some, some terms I, 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 you know, I would have my days full of individual clients and in other terms, you know, I was, I was even affected by the ro the rotation of the German engineers and when they would go back to Germany and, uh Oh, this is the second fall. Like, you know, every second fall, there'd be like a loss. These things were just a part of the life that I had built that was satisfying for both my wife and I, but it had had its difficulties. So in this patience thing that Scott was talking about, you know, uh, selling fries or, you know, I, as, as an independent teacher, <clears throat> I have had times when I have taught absolutely full time. I have had times when I poured concrete and I've had times when I sold cigars, you know, and, but, but it was important to our family that I continue being a teacher. And that was how it could happen. We're not telling you necessarily to go, go get a construction job at all. We're just, I'm just saying like, there's a, there's, that's a way the patients manifests itself is finding a diversity of good work to do. Mm. but mostly teaching and lots of teaching for Kepler. <laughs> well, that's, you know, that's, that's, a, that was, that, uh, that's a really good point. The one, one really good way to know whether you should be a teacher or not is how it affects the people around you. Mm. That's a, that's a really good point. Your wife likes you better when you're a teacher. Yeah. That's a good. <laughs> uh, well, yeah. So, so Ryan follows up on my comment. We like Paul being a tent maker. Yeah, and you know, I, so I don't want the takeaway to be that you know this is you know as an independent teacher you're choosing to always be a tent maker. Uh, but uh, but I, I really did want to emphasize instead the the flexibility and patience that you can have in building this. And you know, for me, it, I, it was a priority not to be part of a big institution. Um, but actually, you can be part of a, of a bigger institution and also, you know, teach for Kepler and do some other things. There are a lot of different ways this can happen. Early on, um, uh, Roxana uh, made the comment. Uh, where was her comment? Uh, Roxana just, just talked about how what she wants to do is teach art and be a mom. Boom. Right. And that that's an independent teacher. Mm hmm. Well, gentlemen, thank you so much for your you know, just watching the comments and seeing you know, the teachers, uh, particularly you know, we, Wes. We told you you were going to be the star of this, and you have been, like it or not. Uh, that it was an absolute thrill, I know, for all of our teachers to be able to uh, to, to hear your wisdom. Thank you. Well, thank you. It's been an honor. Epic for me. Epic. <laughs> okay. Well, uh, as we go ahead and sign off. Uh, Wes, Scott, you guys can stay online. Uh, we'll say goodbye to everyone else, and then you, uh, we can we can have a little chat afterwards. Thank you, thank you, guys, everyone for being here. And uh, this will be uploaded, and you guys will be able to share it with the, with everyone else shortly. Thanks so much, everyone. Bye bye. <laughs>